Hi, I'm Jim Cowan. I'm the director of Orfind, structural geologist, sedimentologist, and I'm also the conceptual founder of LiveFrog Software. Today I'm going to talk about lessons learned from conceptualizing LiveFrog Software. But basically it's a recipe that may lead to paradigm shifts in mineral exploration. In 2001, when Google was only about two years old, LeapFrog started from a Google search. These are the words that I entered into Google search. And I found Professor Rick Beetson, who wrote a rapid method of interpolating in 3D. But this talk is not about the history of LeapFrog software. It's about what geologists like you can do to think differently in the mining and exploration industry. At the end of the talk, I will give some suggestions on how to plan your own paradigm shift. It's the strategy that resulted in the leapfrog concept. It also has been refined over the years from modeling hundreds of deposits. An invention like leapfrog, by definition, is non-obvious and is often discovered by asking a non-obvious question. But in hindsight, not obvious questions appear very obvious to everyone. And the opportunity to ask these key questions are often right under our noses, but geologists fail to see them. Questions such as, why do you digitize in sections to produce 3D models? Or why can't you simply interpolate in 3D to model geological boundaries? Yet there are very few people who can come up with these non-obvious questions at the appropriate moment. Why is that so? In the mining industry, I think it's to do with the hidden biases that geologists are not aware of. These biases prevent geologists from seeing the real patterns and prevents you from asking the non-obvious questions that lead to great shifts in thinking. The following slides show an example of such a bias. This bias is widespread and affects the entire geological community, yet unknown to almost all geologists. So imagine in this box a profile of a single fold. What did you see in your mind? Did you see an antiform or a synform. In 1998, I conducted the following experiment at the University of Western Australia, where I was working. I selected 32 geologists from the geology department and 32 non-geologists randomly from campus, and they were asked to fill in the following question sheet. This question sheet explained what a fault train was, and it showed synform, an example of synform and antiform as shown here. Now, the person was to draw a single pro fold profile, so they had a choice between synform and an ant form on this left box. On the right box, they were to draw a circle and indicate the direction in which they drew the circle. So this is an example here, an antiform, and also the circle is drawn in clockwise fashion. I wanted to see whether there was a correlation between the way people drew their circle and the choice between antiform and synform. There was no correlation. Now, if you get a uh, random selection of these two uh, choices, it's a coin toss probability, basically. So if you get a computer to do this, basically the expected is uh, 0.5 of antiform bias. Now, if you look at the non-geologists, the distribution is very similar to this. The non-geologists, the 32 of them, the probability turned out to be 0.56, bias towards the antiform. The geologists, on the other hand, their bias was extreme, uh, probability being 0.94. So the geologists are clearly a different population from the non-geologists. By the way, I have repeated this experiment on live audiences at two different uh, geological conferences. In each conference, there are about 300 people in the room, and I asked the same question. 
and there was an overwhelming bias towards antiform, about 95% in each. So I, I am quite confident that uh, this experiment is scalable. So a real roulette wheel looks like this. But a geological roulette wheel looks like this. So there appears to be a psychological transformation of non-geologists to geologists, as shown with this arrow. How does this occur? Well, if you look at textbooks in structural geology, what you will see is that when they introduce folds in the textbook, they almost always show antiforms as illustrations. So I think there is an educational bias here. I can't be really sure, but I think there is. I just want to explain a few things about biases. The population is unaware of the bias. Otherwise, bias would be eliminated, of course. Everyone is doing it, so it rarely ever gets challenged. Biased ideas are reported as fact, often by experts, and not as hypotheses that can be changed. Biased ideas are often complex and difficult to understand, so they rarely ever get challenged by the less informed. Biases can only be found unless you specifically look for them. The fold test identified a harmless educational bias, but are these types of educational biases really harmless? Well, I personally think they are very damaging to the exploration industry. I'm going to explain why I think this um, bias is very dangerous by taking a modeling example first. This is an early leapfrog experiment conducted uh, January 2002. This is the early stages of when we we're experimenting with how to model uh, geological objects from drill hole data. So what I've done here is to take a known shape on the right hand side, a hand, and then stick it into the draw hole data to see whether we can actually model the hand uh, as closely as possible to the original from the draw hole sampling. So you have the hand inside the draw hole data on the right hand side. Now if you select the data within the hand, you have that on the left hand side. On the surface of the hand, these are the points that lie on the surface of the hand, the boundary of the hand model must honor these points. These are the points that are outside of the hand model. So once we have all these points, we can actually interpolate and uh, extract that surface that is between the inside and outside. And this is what it looks like. So this is not a bad model. There is nothing um, informing this modeling process, it is just simply from the samplings of the, um, the draw hole data of the hand. I just want to explain something between hand digitization versus interpolation here. Now interpolation is faster of course, but there is no fundamental difference in terms of geological input in this particular example here. Both methods are independent of geological knowledge. So if we take a kimberlite pipe, for example, here, which was published in 2003, the left-hand side is constructed from a series of um, polylines that are digitized in plan and joined uh, to create this 3D model. On the right-hand side is a leapfrog-generated interpolated boundary. The only difference between these two models is that the leapfrog model took maybe a minute to generate, whereas the other one, the polyline, version on the left hand side would have taken quite a few hours. But fundamentally though, there is no real difference in the way these two models are constructed. That is, there is really no geological information incorporated into the modeling process. So some people have said that leapfrog is the fastest way to the wrong solution. And I tend to agree with this. The wrong solution being 
a non-geological solution. Geologists can tell by looking at the model whether it's right or wrong because some are completely unrealistic in terms of geology. So I thought about this modeling process and there is a different way of modeling and that is taking to consideration of the expected morphology. We know, for example, in this experiment, what we're trying to do is construct a hand. Well, let's just imagine that a mineral deposits all look like a hand. So if you know that fact, you can actually incorporate the hand morphology into the modeling process. Effectively, what you're doing is using a training scheme to actually the, doing the modeling. Which leads to a non-obvious question. Why can't we just use the 3D morphologies of known deposit styles to fast track the modeling of deposits? Well, let's just see the um, 3D morphology of mineral deposits. Now, if we take this academic work, this is the 100th anniversary volume of economic geology published in 2005. This is a very thick book, over 1,000 pages long, but only one three-dimensional model of deposit. And this is it. This is the Oyutogo deposit. And yeah, it's, it's not such a great illustration. It really doesn't explain what's happening here with this deposit. But that's the only illustration in that book. So this is the book, uh, basically a Bible of mineral deposit styles and there's only one 3D illustration of a mineral deposit. This is rather confusing, but this is a pattern actually in the academic literature. This is a book about the giant Kid Creek VMS deposit. This is also a massive volume, lots of cartoons, but no 3D model at all. Now let's just take a, an example here. If you look at how birds are classified, Morphology is very important. If you look at how dogs are classified, obviously morphology is important as well. Now, let's look at how mineral deposits are classified. If you type in ore deposit classification into Google image, this is what you get. Lots of tables, schematic cross sections and chemical tables. If you type in orogenic gold, you get the same thing. Lots of schematic diagrams, generalized cross sections, but no three dimensional models. IOCG deposit model is exactly the same, completely dominated by cartoons. VMS deposit model. Again, the story is the same. My diagnosis is this. The economic geology fraternity suffers from a serious case of schematitis. This is a condition in which all sense of 3D reality is replaced with chemical tables and schematic cartoons, which are in no way a reflection of what is actually found in the real world. I think everyone is familiar with Gray's Anatomy, even though they've never looked through it. This um, anatomy book was published in 1858. And it has wonderful illustrations like this, really detailed illustrations of the human body. Let's just imagine if a geologist had actually written this book. It looks something like this. Schematic diagrams and cartoons of the lung, the skull, and the skeleton. Completely schematic, nothing realistic. So, how harmful is this schematitis? I'm just going to take the VMS deposit model as an example. I could pick any number of mineral deposit models and go through the same process. This is the model, a schematic cross-section of a VMS deposit, 1984. As you can see here, I've highlighted the hydrothermal alteration pipe. This is the Hellia deposit. Uh, this is a reconstruction and uh, a cross-section of the Hellia deposit published in 1992. 
As you can see, the, the uh, sectional geometry is very similar to the previous diagram. This is a VMS deposit uh, model published 1998 by Hannington and others. As you can see here, they highlight an alteration pipe. Going back to uh, Hellier, 2001, the word alteration pipe is actually in the title of this paper, and this is a cross-section of the Hellier ore deposit. Two thousand and fifteen. This is a more um, three-dimensional schematic model, but essentially this model has not really changed uh, from nineteen eighty-four, which leads to a non-obvious question: What is the symmetry system of VMS deposits? Is it radial symmetry, as you see on this, the left-hand diagram, or is it bilateral symmetry? The reason this question is a non-obvious question is because the VMS models, the conceptual models, clearly indicate that VMS deposits have a radial symmetry. But in reality, what do the VMS deposits actually look like? Now I'm just going to take a look at the Heli deposit because I have modeled this and I can actually show you what it actually looks like in, in reality. This is a oblique view of the deposit. The Heli deposit is located here under a plunging antiform. This is the Q River deposit here. This yellow wireframe is the alteration pattern. Now I'm going to take, going to show you a movie that shows a longitudinal section, a cross section first and longitudinal section of this deposit. Now the cross-section looks like this. This is the uh, cross-section published of the Heli deposit and the, exactly the same location here is shown over here, just blown up here. As you can see there's a correspondence between what you see here and what you see here. This is the jack fault that runs right through here. Now I'm going to show you some other views of this deposit in the next movie. So this is the longitudinal section here. As you can see, the deposit is plunging downward, parallel to the fold plunge. We are going to see a series of cross sections as you go down plunge orientation. So these are series of sections orthogonal to the down plunge direction. Alteration in the yellow. So just in case you missed that, the longitudinal section of this mineral deposit is actually looking like this. This is an oblique view of that. So, and that is the cross section. So if you were to look at the heli deposit as it is now, would you say it is a radial symmetry or a bilateral symmetry? And this is clearly what you can see here is bilateral symmetry, not radial. So this radial symmetry that is depicted in the academic literature is actually very misleading. The heli deposit has been used as one of the classic VMS deposits. Yet, when you actually look at that deposit and model it up, it is clearly not the same morphology as the schematized diagrams. This does not help exploration at all. Now, we can take a look at another VMS deposit. This is Kid Creek VMS deposit from Canada, 
This is the largest VMS deposit in the world. And on the left-hand side, you see a cross-section of this deposit. The longitudinal section looks like this. Now, the host rocks at Kig Creek are not radial in symmetry, but bilateral, just like Hellion. The actual deposit itself is located in a closure of a fold, just like Hellion. So the morphology of VMS deposits that are accepted in the literature and illustrated for many decades does not really represent what VMS deposits actually look like. So back to the non-obvious question, why can't we just use the 3D morphologies of known deposit styles to fast track the modeling of deposits? The answer is, we can't do that because no one knows what mineral deposits actually look like in 3D. A normal scientific investigation of mineral deposits would look like this. You have the observation of data in terms of drill holes and mapping. You might model this data in 3D, so that would represent a factual model. Interpretation of data might come at the same time or after that. Then you might get a schematic representation, a so-called theoretical deposit model. What actually happens is this. You get the observation of data, you get the drill holes and mapping, then the interpretation of data takes place, then a schematic representation of the deposit is produced. The 3D modelling part is usually entirely missing in the academic studies. I just want to point out the importance of 3D modelling from raw data. 3D modelling allows the documentation of the current strain state of the mineral deposit. Deposit geometries is often the most important information that we require in exploration, and this is most often the result of structural deformation. Simplified conceptual models effectively ignores the strain of mineral deposits, which is simply not helpful. This brings to why LeapFrog was developed in the first place in 2001. LeapFrog was developed to allow rapid understanding of mineral deposits without having to rely on schematic deposit models, which dominate the scientific literature. The original version of LeapFrog, that is LeapFrog Mining, which I helped to develop, was a software that allowed first principles of structural geology to guide the analytical process. That was the aim of the development. So, is there an alternative method of modelling? If we do not know the geometry of mineral deposits from the literature, do we have an alternative way? So I thought, why can't we just use structural heuristics to model deposits? A heuristic is a rule or method that helps you to resolve problems faster than you would if you did all of the computing. Now, I have discussed this in a paper published last year, looking at patterns of grade at the deposit scale. And these are just some of the examples. I point out in that paper, by looking at the grade distribution of deposits at the deposit scale, you can actually get a, a very good structural understanding of mineral deposits. My paper was published in the OzIMM Guide to Good Practice, monograph 30. You won't miss this uh, paper because if you look through it, there is a picture of a skull in there and also a picture of a rugby field and a broken piano. And there are no other papers like this in that volume. So is there an alternative method of modeling? So I'm going to show you an example of the use of structural heuristics with 3D geological modeling and how it compares to a modeling process that does not involve that process. I have a structural exercise here from a textbook from the 1960s. And what I've done is to convert this uh, information into a 3D model by just following the exercise. 
I have uh, lithologies A and B. And as you can clearly see, this is a folded interface between the two lithologies. I put in some parallel drill holes, as you can see here, along drill hole fences. This is on the left-hand side, looking from a plan view, an oblique view on the right-hand side. And I've created this model, lithology A and B, as you can see in blue and pink. Now, I'm going to just assume that this is the uh, distribution of lithology. And I can then take this information and then create drill hole data from it by just drilling holes in this model. So I can create holes in any direction, actually. And I can use a random number generator and generate a whole bunch of holes. So um, this is one set on the left-hand side, uh, uh, 10 drill holes for one set. And I did 10 of those experiments, including the one with uh, the parallel fence drilling that I had initially. And these are all the holes on the right-hand side. So this is the initial parallel uh, fence drilling. This is a traditional way of sampling. And these are the 10 randomly drilled uh, samples. So the objective of this exercise is to actually come up with a model that looks like the original that I created from these samplings. That's the aim of the exercise. Now, if you model this, these, all these drill holes, and these, this is the, the fence drilling at the top, left and all the others are randomly drilled. Now the model, if you model it isotropically, this really depends on your sampling of course. So a model over here on the uh, middle left hand side here looks quite different from the lower right. Now if you were to interpret that data, it would be very difficult to do that. But extra information, extra structural information, including the contact between A and B by just mapping on that surface and incorporating that single polyline contact, and also working out the plunge of the fold and incorporating that into the process of modeling, you end up with 11 models that are virtually identical to each other. And this is the modeling process using structural heuristics. Without this, you get the previous image. You can get anything from these drill holes. But with structural heuristics, I can demonstrate that it doesn't really matter uh, whether you have fence drilling or random drilling, you will get the same result. So this is a slice through the model towards the bottom of the, the model. Uh, and showing the contact of uh, A and B, the trace of the contact of A and B, at this depth. So without structural heuristics on the left-hand side, the contact goes all over the place. And uh, it's at the mercy of the sampling. Whereas with the structural heuristics on the right-hand side, you can see that the, the, the contact between A and B does not wander away too far. And so the power of incorporating structural knowledge into the deposit modeling is incredibly powerful. So in modern geological practice in the mining and exploration industry, there are dominating beliefs and behaviors entrenched in this industry that prevent us from seeing the existing patterns of deformation in mineral deposits. Knowing these patterns is more important to exploration than any published theoretical model. Recognizing these limitations will allow geologists to ask the non-obvious questions, which will lead to new ideas and discoveries and maybe even a paradigm change. Here I list six evils of modern geological practice that effectively you should ignore. All deposit models, from a structural and geometry point of view, these are quite disastrous. 
Generalized cross-section summaries. These are way too generalized. Mineral deposit diagrams without any structural context is very common in the literature. This is very damaging. Schematic 3D block diagrams also very damaging. And I showed you an example of the VMS deposit model. Now, I've not discussed this, but popularized structural models of deposits is also can be damaging. I might discuss this another time. So traditional entrench methods of sampling, such as fence drilling, people have done that for quite a few decades now. Now it's time to rethink this process of sampling because you can actually get very good, accurate models from the drill hole data if you incorporate structural knowledge into the modeling process. So what do we do instead? We need to integrate structural geological observations at all scales, not just from outcrop scale, but at all scales, including the deposit scale. Use the first principles of structural geology to interpret deposits. This is outlined in my paper published last year. And we need to use structural heuristics to shortcut the modeling process. We need to generate real scaled models, not just schematized 3D diagrams. These will represent the current strain state and not schematic cartoons that ignore deformation. Thank you very much. If you found this presentation interesting and would like to discuss some more details, please do not hesitate to get in touch with me by email. My email is jun.cowan at orfine.com. You may also be interested in our 3D modeling and structural geology blog posts. We strive to be thought-provoking, but also practical. You can find these at orfine.com backslash blog. So, I look forward to hearing from you.